And while AI can't write quality scripts, it can easily spit out cheap video essays on YouTube or clickbait farms on TikTok. As attainable internet content becomes the new norm, the question isn't if AI can surpass the skill of the writer, but if the AI can drown out the writer enough that general audiences don't care. Talentless hacks will obviously try to use AI to cut the line, but ultimately human nature is simply better at writing stories than computers. Today is going to be a bit different. I'd like to revisit one of my videos from last year. Since then, AI has become a lot more prevalent and the discussion around it has become a lot more annoying, so I'd like to give an update on my writer's perspective of generative systems and how it relates to the world of creative writing. Plus, I'm still getting better at making videos in general. I'm not completely happy with my current style, but I think it's better overall than when I made the first AI video, so I think it's worth redoing anyway when considering how pervasive this topic is right now. If you've seen that older video, rest assured my overall opinion has not changed. In fact, things are pretty much going the way I expected them to. Unfortunately, things being how I expected them does not change the fact that I'm an unhappy fox in the overall discussion. It may sound weird, but I don't actually mind the technology itself at all. I'm only upset about a lot of people and the corporations. You see, the technology itself is not that far from what we've already been experiencing for a long time. Normal machine learning has been around for years, and the language models have been around for almost as long as well. The difference is, it wasn't really widely available to the public until quite recently. However, the general principles of all of this have been the driving force behind Google Ads, YouTube recommendations, and all of the other personal data theft that we're all so familiar with at this point. And their respective shapes, the YouTube algorithm and ChatGPT are not that different. They have large amounts of data points, and when given an input, they give a statistical average from the data as the output. The difference is that the prompts on the YouTube side of things are not words, but rather your watch activity, and instead of words coming out, it's the videos that YouTube calculated to be the ones you are most likely to click on. Therein lies why the technology itself does not bother me. Yes, I'm tired of my data constantly being harvested, but that's pretty much just an unavoidable reality at this point. But it's an unavoidable reality we have already been living in for years at this point. Therefore, it's just not as pressing of a concern when it comes to daily life. Now, when I say people are what annoy me about this whole AI situation, that is because there are two factions that hover around the discussion and give the kinds of permission that the corporations are looking for in regards to shoving all of it down our throats. The first are what I like to call the indifference, and the second are the fanboys. I'll start with the indifference. The indifference are the people who simply do not care about the situation at all. The problem is, even someone who doesn't use generative AI is going to get completely walked over by the corporations. It will always be in your way at the top of your internet searches, in the margins of your word processors, and your abilities are always going to be measured against it by people who don't actually understand what it is you do. Yet, again, they are indifferent. They don't care that the images they see are fake or that the accuracy of their searches is skewed. Their indifference gives an impression to the corporations that such behavior is acceptable because they get zero backlash when they ruin yet another feature that was easy and direct before with a system that steps into the middle and makes approximations, giving less control to the user for a slower and ultimately less reliable service. There isn't much else to say about them, but you get my point. Ignoring AI completely is exactly what the corporations want from people who don't use it. However, the fanboys are the group with which I have the biggest bone to pick. This is the group that has decided they want generative AI models to run everything. The richest own Cybertrucks that drive them around while they wear Apple Vision headsets. Others are advocates for e-waste such as those AI coat button items. Many of the other users use ChatGPT to write all of their papers, emails, and even resumes and case briefings. The worst of all are my main target, though, the people who use image generators to lazily enter the art scene and text generators to lazily enter the writing scene. What kills me is that they aren't winning so much as they are just getting in the way of everyone else. But to explain what I mean about that, we need to take a step back. One comment I've seen come up over and over is that art and writing are, quote, hobbies, and nobody is entitled to be paid for their hobbies. 
This is simply not a true argument. Writing and art are hobbies for some people, but actual day jobs for others. Much like how I write and compile code as a hobby, while there are people who do it for their job. The only conclusion is that there is no objective way to categorize an action as definitively a job or a hobby, as there are people who accomplish that action as both. Now, famously, the quality of generative AI work is not good. It's better than it was, sure, but an actual artist's portfolio is going to be of consistently higher quality than that of an AI model. Generative AIs can only work in averages, so the results will always be average. Writing is less visible, but the same principle applies. These slapdash AI novels are atrociously bad in quality because they completely lack subtext, and as I've said before, if you don't have subtext, you don't have a story. The reality is, generative AIs are not minds. They have no creativity. They have no understanding. When someone reads a story, what they want is something they can both intellectually and emotionally engage with. A generative AI can put pretty words on a page, but there is none of that emotional understanding for the reader to connect to. Just as the person with an eye for art still prefers the artist on even objective quality grounds, the avid reader will prefer the author for the same objective quality grounds. So why do people still try? I'm not a visual artist, so I can't really say anything about that field specifically, but I'm willing to bet it's similar to the writing situation. The people who are trying to get ahead by abusing these tools are simply ignorant of how all of this works. Writing a novel is not about getting to a certain word count. In fact, the actual typing process is the easiest step. Novels take years of planning, researching, testing, and editing before the final draft even has a word typed. How the earlier steps are handled are what will give a novel the things that make it enjoyable or not. Sure, you can just have ChatGPT spit out enough words to upload to Kindle Direct Publishing, and you might even con a reader or two to accidentally buy it. But here's the thing. Reading isn't as popular in the mainstream anymore. The people who read are enthusiasts of reading. They have taste. Once they see you dumped AI slop on them, they'll roll their eyes and move on to a real book. That's why none of this is a threat to writers who know their craft. If you can write well, you will still be able to get your stories into journals and your books to publishers through an agent. The first annoying part of all of this is just the sheer number of people just spewing AI vomit over everything and making the experience of looking for something to read into more of a chore than it has to be because now we have to shovel out mountains of worthless nothing just to get to what we wanted to read in the first place. The second annoying part comes from all of the people who participate in the vomiting and then try to claim themselves as authors when they know nothing about the craft and only know how to self-publish through Amazon, not publish the normal way. I assume the visual arts are dealing with the exact same annoyances, but with their terminology. Why? Well, I was looking for wallpapers, and I had to go out of my way to get away from the endless generated AI garbage. A way to put this broadly is that the AI fanboys are missing the point. None of this is about getting as much crap out as possible and the readers trying to fill their time with as much crap as possible. Someone looking for good art, or a good story, or a good video, or a good song, or anything else like this is looking for something that is worth their time. This is abstract, so let's use an example. I try to avoid topics about YouTube directly. I'm a writer. My channel is where I talk about writing. Other channels are other channels, and I don't see any need to talk about them. Except today. You see, the best example of what I'm talking about is Quibble Cup. Let's take a look at one of these AI videos. Navigating birch trees, popping red flowers, it's like Mother Nature's pixelated garden party. Look, I'm gardening! Sneaking under leaves, it's stealth mode me. Aha, pretty flowers, gonna make a fancy bouquet. Swinging axe, another tree bites the dust. Ah, fresh air and deforestation, my kind of day. Creeping under canopies, giant birch sheep, wool tactic camouflage, or nature's Minecraft prank. Absolutely hilarious. Crafting ninja, I've struck white gold, wool for days. Whoa, sneaky birch playing hide and seek. Pika block, love me some hidden gems in this leafy wonderland. Bumbling through brush, my botanical escapade. Let's think about this for a moment. What is the point of making a gaming video? Well, why do people watch gaming content? 
As everyone and their mother should know by now, it's usually to engage with the creator. A Minecraft playthrough is not about Minecraft itself, but rather a person as they experience Minecraft. It's like how members of older generations were confused about gaming content as an idea. You know, they were wondering why watch someone playing a game when you could just play the game. Well, it's because there is an emotional engagement to watching someone experience something. There is even a term for it, parasocial relationships. It's also why reaction content is popular. Some people like watching a person experiencing a video. Looking back at the Equibblecop clip, you can start to see the issue. There is no person experiencing anything. It's a bot playing the game, another bot writing the commentary, and then another bot running that commentary from text to speech while an animated face moves around in the corner. It's empty, and it misses the point. QuibbleCop wants to say this is the future of content creation, but I don't see how that's really gonna take off. He claims it was much harder to go down this road setting all of it up than just making the videos normally, but it's still a blatant attempt at eventually needing zero effort at all, and then getting upset when no one wants to watch the content. If you make gaming videos, then you thrive off of parasocial relationships. If you take away the person, then there's nothing to build that foundation off of. Now that video is a waste of storage on YouTube servers, a waste of time on the internet's traffic, a waste of a slot in someone else's recommendations, and a waste of time for anyone who clicks on it. It doesn't threaten real YouTubers, just makes the browsing process that much worse for the viewers. With all of that being said, the question remains, are there any legitimate excuses to use these tools creatively? Actually, yes. Now, again, I can't speak for the visual arts world, but I'm sure the visual artists can find parallels with the writing world on this one. Text generating AIs like ChatGPT are LLMs, or large language models. A good LLM can actually be a very powerful and helpful tool in the writer's belt. They are rough right now for a few reasons. The main one is that they are primarily reliant on remote computing, so basically inputs are uploaded to a server, analyzed, and then sent back. It's a slow and clunky process and exposes everything you input to internet traffic. If completely locally running LLMs become available, and you can train yours to your own liking, then there are some things that would make it quite helpful. For example, note organizing. Type up all of your notes about a fictional world, a plot, a character, or anything else, and shove it into your trained generative AI, and task it to organize and index all of your notes. Then, if you forget something, you can ask your AI, and it would be able to search your notes for you and tell you the answer. Notice how the story's quality will not be affected by the AI, because you're still writing it yourself, but with a lot of the time-wasting part of writing notes and then trying to find them again, smoothed out. Generative AI is also good at brute-forcing ideas for you. It filters in details, but if you just need to know if it's possible to connect A and B, you can glance at ChatGPT and see if it has a general output or if it has to jump through serious hoops. Again, you have to be careful, though. None of the ideas are ever that particularly amazing, and are almost certainly just an amalgamation of what everyone else has done, but it can at least show you the kinds of directions available to you. Your job is still to make something original, but AI can indicate how possible or contrived something is. ChatGPT 3.5 can already do this to some extent, although it leaves quite a lot to be desired. It tends to make inaccurate assessments about notes, and the fact it doesn't run locally is a big pain. ChatGPT4 is better about a lot of it, but it's still not perfect. For as long as the model requires a remote server, it will never be the perfect assistant for you, because OpenAI is not going to let you fill your own threads with tons and tons and tons of custom training data. Now, before I say specifically what I am looking forward to as far as a helpful generative AI system, I do want to take a moment to address the idea of a general AI, or whatever the new term is. I'm talking about artificial consciousness, a computer that can actually think and be creative. I don't think it will happen. 
Now, I'm no expert in the computer realm, but I've been a pedestrian for quite some time and did consider working in software engineering before I realized how much I dislike software engineering. Plus, one of my degrees is in philosophy with a particular focus on the human mind. And yeah, I don't see computers actually doing it. Part of my issue with the concept of general AI is with the Turing test. Saying a computer is conscious if it can convince a person that it is conscious is just not how reality works. You can program a computer to tone its responses in certain ways. Being funny, I instructed ChatGPT to be casual, playful, and teasing in how it answers me because I like the idea of a computerized sarcasm system. What a person is convinced to believe is independent of the facts at hand, and rather just dependent on the way it's presented. Look at how many people are already convinced that LLMs are conscious. It's absurd. The answer is also not found in raw computing power. Today's computers can perform operations a human brain can't. You can add all of the hardware potential you want, but a computer isn't going to just start thinking. They follow programming, and there's no evidence that lines of code can even be the basis of thought. We still haven't been able to nail down exactly what human consciousness is and how it interacts with the electrical signals in our neurons, so we are nowhere near being able to write code in such a way that the electrical signals in the transistors could form a consciousness. Even if we ignore all of that and assume that one day humanity creates an artificial consciousness, I don't see that situation ending well at all. So the plan is to create a machine that can think and feel, and then instruct it to serve us and do our bidding? Have we not yet learned how slavery is a bad idea? And if you program it to not mind being used in servitude, then why not just continue using a non-conscious system? And if you take the position that such a system wouldn't really have rights, then look at how slavery has ended for those who have upheld it before. On top of all of that, there is the other issue that no conscious being is perfect at anything. Current computers aren't perfect either, but we've grown used to expecting glitches and errors. We take our data with a grain of salt as we interpret it. An alarming number of people would just assume everything a general AI says is true, and that could lead to disastrous consequences. It's an unknown frontier that offers the same benefits of a more refined computing experience as we know it already, but with risks we cannot yet comprehend. It's a gamble made by a small group of people using all of humanity's chips, and that just isn't a right anyone is granted. So where do I see the future of AI? Well, what I want is the ability to have a locally stored LLM that can have custom training. If laptops and the like aren't able to run it efficiently, then maybe have the LLM on a home server that can be accessed. Computers can be more helpful to us as we are able to interact with them in a more natural way, but ultimately, we would still be in control. In all likelihood, the future of AI will be very similar to that, except with more licensing and subscription fees, and on top of harvesting an ever-increasing amount of our personal data to feed the corporations that annoy our daily lives. To answer the overall topic at hand, I'd like to reword it. Writers should not fear AI being better than us at writing. We should fear people who abuse AI to make everyone's lives, writer or not, more annoying because the ignorant will judge everyone they don't understand against AI. And with that, keep writing.